Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Good afternoon. Um, thanks very much, uh, especially for the invitation to be here. It's a great pleasure to come uh, to Melbourne. And coming all the way from Rotterdam, I realized that in fact Melbourne and Rotterdam are quite similar because they both have great modern architecture, they are multicultural and have a lot of water, and even uh, the weather is un un as unpredictable. Today there was a huge shower here in, uh, in Melbourne. So um, they, they are also as different as day as, and night, in fact uh, quite literally, because uh, when it's daytime here, it's night in Rotterdam, and for me it feels a little bit like night uh, at the moment, to be honest. So today I will talk about uh, benefits and challenges of translating preclinical studies into clinical practice. And I will talk uh, also about uh, translation from mice or rats to human beings. And even though we have 97% uh, of our genetic material in common, these animals can be different as day and night from us as well, as we can only see from the exterior already. But nevertheless, we can obtain very useful data using them. So I will focus on radio-labeled uh, somatostatin analogs, and we have seen this list over and over again uh, today with Dota Talk and Dota Tate being most widely used in, uh, in the clinic, and also the antagonist being very, very interesting coming up in clinical studies now. And all these um, radiopeptides are based on the same fission. It's a simple fission. Let's take a peptide with a high affinity for the receptor, uh, attach a chelator, perhaps a linker in between, label it with a radio metal, and you have your uh, tracer for imaging and for therapy. But we have to realize that not only the peptide sequence, but also the radio metal and the chelator and the linker can all influence the receptor affinity and the pharmacokinetics. So for each combination, we have to test if these tracers still adhere to the tumor characteristics of the ideal tracer, the characteristics of the ideal tracer, and that is having a high binding affinity, probably you cannot reach it, read it, but it's here, high binding affinity, high specific activity, high peptide stability, and a low toxicity profile. So this has to be evaluated prior to human application. In models, it should be as representative as possible. So we aim also in the mice for tumor models that have a good behavior. So there should be a high receptor expression, as seen on the right, high tumor perfusion. If the peptide is not delivered at the tumor site, there will be no uptake, even though there's a high receptor expression. There should be a high tumor to background ratio and very favorable pharmacokinetics. So what we study in preclinical studies is this cycle of research. We start uh, in the left upper corner with target validation and binding of the tracer. And we most often do that on tissue sections, very often of uh, human material, where we test in autoradiography studies the, the affinity for the receptor. And then we move on to in vitro studies in cells. And uh, for the tracer, we can test the target affinity, internalization properties, and retention properties. Whereas for the model, we can get information on target expression, the density, and also the radio sensitivity for radionuclide therapy studies. And if all is favorable, we can start in vivo studies in small animals. And we have these beautiful imaging machines now, so we can image a mouse and a red light. We can image a patient. And from these, uh, in vivo studies, we should at least get information on the pharmacokinetics and the short-term toxicity according to the microdosing principle. And if all is okay, we can start clinical studies. And very often, from the clinical studies, new questions are arisen, so we go to, into back translation, we go back to the animals and find solutions for, uh, for instance, reducing uptake in normal organs, or we even go back all the way to the target and find ourselves a better target. So, a little bit in more detail on the role of in vivo animal studies. These can be used to determine the biodistribution, so the uptake in a tumor versus the normal organs. Uh, we can look at the tumor to organ absorbed dose in the therapeutic setting. Those limiting organs can be determined as well as the maximal tolerated uh, administered dose. 
We can look at the pharmacokinetics to see what the body does to the, with the tracer, and also to the pharmacodynamics, so to see what the tracer does with the body. But of course, um, animal studies can never replace patient studies, and we have to be aware that animals and patients are not the same. So there are quite some challenges. So there's huge differences in heart rate, metabolism, clearance rate, much faster in these small animals than in the patients. We uh, have to be aware of uh, species differences with, receptor to, uh, with regard to receptor affinity. So we should avoid having a nice tracer that binds only to uh, the mouse receptor and not the human receptor or we think we have an excellent tracer with no uptake in normal organs, but it's simply because there is no affinity for the mouse receptor. We have seen examples of for that. So these small animals uh, often have uh, more easily a saturation of the receptor, so we need high specific activity. Anesthesia can uh, really influence the physiology in the animals and can mask all kinds of findings that we have. We should re realize that these animals often have, uh, are immune deficient, so how important is the immune system for the therapeutic uh, response? And also the uh, tumor proliferation rate can be quite different in these uh, preclinical models. Nevertheless, there's quite some successes in translation, and I will show you two examples. They are quite old. It, I will show these not because we have no better, more recent examples, but just to show how happy I am that I was privileged to be a part of early developments in the field uh, related to the somatostatin uh, uh, imaging, receptor imaging and therapy. So this was the period when we realized that tyrosine 3-octreotide and tyrosine 3-octreotate had a better uptake in tumors in, uh, in rats and also the better tumor to kidney ratio. And this led us to the introduction of uh, both compounds and especially the octreotate in the clinic. And we all know, of course, that both Dotatoc and Dotatate are uh, uh, widely used now, both for imaging of the labeling with uh, gallium-68, mostly for PET, and for uh, radionuclide therapy, mostly of the labeling with yttrium-90 or lutetium-177. Both beta particle emitters with a difference in that the beta particles emitted by yttrium-90 have the higher energy, 2.3 MeV versus 0.5 MeV, and a longer range in tissue, 11 millimeters versus two millimeters at the max. And these differences, they also lead to a difference in the percentage of energy absorption in tumors of different size. So for instance, when we consider tumors smaller than three millimeters, for yttrium-90, only 26% of the energy will be absorbed in the lesion, whereas for lutetium, this will still be 88%. So, and this is in line with the paper of O'Donoghue of 1995, where he stated that using lutetium peptides, lutetium labeled peptides, there will be a high cure probability in the small, in the small tumors, whereas for yttrium-90, there will be a high cure probability in the bigger size lesions, and that probably the combination would lead to a good tumor response, a high cure uh, probability in a wider range of tumor sizes. So this we tested in, uh, in rats, bearing both very small and larger tumors, and we compared yttrium-90 octreotate versus lutetium octreotate in doses that gave the same dose, radiation dose in gray. So we uh, injected the animals either with lutetium octreotate or with a lower dose of yttrium octreotate or with 50% of both in the combination series. And what we found was that the animals that had the combination, shown here in the green line in the survival curve, had a better survival than the animals that had only yttrium-90 or lutetium-labeled octreotate. So the combination was superior, and it was great to see that in clinical studies, and uh, the references that I showed here are not complete, there's more studies now, that also in clinical studies, the combination gives a significant longer median survival than uh, only the, the yttrium labeled octreotide in this case. Also tandem therapy is being performed, so that's alternating uh, forms of yttrium and lutetium labeled peptides. So this is from the past, but also we would like to look at the future. So we have our own uh, uh, list of proposals on how to do better. 
And one of the important things is that uh, we are convinced that we need more knowledge on the PRT cellular mechanisms. So we heard already uh, about the double-stranded break formation after lutetium dota octreotate in the DNA. So here's the irradiation and here is your double-stranded break. And this will attract all kinds of repair proteins like the 53BP1 to the uh, um, break in the, in the DNA. And these can be nicely stained using immunofluorescent techniques to detect these uh, BP, uh, 53 BP1 proteins. And uh, we can visualize this and we see these uh, foci in the cells. This is a non-treated cell. The blue in blue is the nucleus and you see the foci. And this is a cell treated with uh, lutetium octreotate and you see the increase, the huge increase in the number of foci in the cell. We can do this not only in single cells in culture, but also in tissue slices taken from surgical samples from patients. And Julie Nonneken, postdoc in our group, she has optimized this technique for neuroendocrine tumors. So she gets the tumor from the surgeon and she makes uh, slices up to four millimeters thick and she can uh, culture them in, uh, in tissue culture and keep them alive and in good shape for about one week. So during this week, we can perform PRT and look at the responses to the therapy. Afterwards, the slices can be embedded in paraffin, they can be sliced into histological slices, and they can be stained, and we can look uh, for DNA repair. So we do comparisons of the human uh, tumors versus uh, xenograft slices to optimize the techniques. And finally, we aim to use this technique for uh, determining the radio sensitivity and also for combination with the genomic techniques that have been uh, presented earlier today. So these are um, studies in cells that she did. So uh, here uh, Julie looked at the double-stranded break formation by lutetium dotatate in, uh, in cells. She gave um, a pulse of four hours of lutetium dotatate and then she washed the cells and uh, gave fresh medium without radioactivity. And at certain time points, she fixed the cells and she looked for DNA damage and repair. Afterwards, she quantified all the, the foci and what she found that after lutetium octreotate, there was an increased number of foci at day zero, day one, two, and three, but not anymore at day four, five, and six. So apparently all the DNA damage was repaired at these time points. So the question, of course, was that we wondered, how can we prolong this damage to the cells? And then we have to realize that lutetium makes double-stranded breaks, but the majority of damage to the DNA is single-stranded breaks that can be repaired easily. But there's a way to transfer single-stranded breaks into double-stranded breaks, and that's by inhibiting PARP that's involved in the repair of the single-stranded break. So if we use a PARP inhibitor, which are used in the clinic, for instance in breast cancer therapy, then this uh, single-stranded break will not be repaired and upon replication of the cell it will become a double-stranded break, which is more difficult to repair and tumor cells might die. So Shelly did her whole protocol again. She did again a four-hour pulse with lutetium octreotate and then she washed the cells, there was no radioactivity anymore apart from the radioactivity that was internalized into the cells, and then she added the PARP inhibitor, and she looked again during six days at the number of foci in the cells. And what she found was that with the combination with the PARP inhibitor in purple here had a higher number of foci in the cell, gave rise to a higher number, but also for a longer period. All six days of the experiment, the uh, DNA damage and repair was ongoing, so there it was still... Um, present in the cells. So this was a nice way to improve um, the DNA damage and, and make the therapy work better. So there was more DNA damage of the combination with PARP inhibitors, and this has to be confirmed now in vivo in animals, and we would love to have this confirmed in clinical trials as well. So uh, another way to improve uh, PRT is to have better analogs, and the antagonists have been uh, mentioned a few times already. They cause quite a paradigm shift because they do not internalize into the cells, but nevertheless they have higher uptake because there's more binding sites, 
And despite the fact that they are not internalized, there's still longer retention of the radioactivity in the cells. So that sounds like a miracle. This is also shown here. We have these cells that have some metastatin receptors which are fluorescent so that you can follow upon the binding of the agonist or the antagonist. So here is non-treated cells. In blue, again, the staining of the nuclei. And here you see um, after binding of octreotate, we see all the receptors clustering in the cell. And it's nice that in combination with the staining of the nucleus, we can see it's really around the nucleus, so the radioactivity is really close to the nucleus. And when we do co-staining with the culture, we see this is really the culture where it's uh, located. And here is the antagonist, and we see that still the fluorescence is all over the surface of the cell, so there's no internalization. But despite this, if we give the same dose to the cells, we see that the number of double-stranded breaks, here the uh, orange bar, after uh, the antagonist, the JR11, is higher than after the agonist. So this is very interesting, and we also found that we could translate this to the in vivo situation in animals, that we had a better therapeutic outcome after uh, the same dose of lutetium JR11, which is the antagonist versus the agonist lutetium octreotate. So the antagonist labeled with lutetium led to a higher accumulating, uh, accumulation in the tumor cells and higher irradiation effects, so more double-stranded breaks. And this is to be confirmed, we also saw that in the mice, in comparative randomized clinical trials. There was this uh, interesting uh, pilot study that has been shown before today that in uh, a limited number of patients, a low dose lutetium dota tate was compared with lutetium dota GR11, the antagonist. And the isodose curves showed us that the, um, the higher dose was obtained with the antagonist, and also there was a higher tumor to organ dose ratio. And afterwards, this group went on with the high dose. Uh, therapy with the JR11, but there was no comparison yet with the agonist, and it would be interesting to see this also in clinical studies now. So what I uh, uh, try to tell you is that these preclinical studies, they can help us in the correctoration of tumor response. Um, we can use neuroendocrine tumor samples, as I showed you, or xenograft tumor models, in vivo, in vitro uh, irradiation effects uh, can be obtained. They can tell us about radio sensitivity of different tumor samples or different tumor types. They can give an estimation of the dose limits to normal organs. We can investigate uh, repair mechanisms of the DNA, the kinetics of uh, DNA repair and pathways of repair, and perhaps inhibitors of these pathways can help us to improve therapeutic effects in the patients in order to uh, finally have the uh, optimized uh, treatment schedules for our patients and well, and, uh, as well and aim for tailor-made therapy. Last but not least, I would like to thank my colleagues and former colleagues in, uh, in our department, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marian. Beautiful piece of radiobiology in this not many groups doing that kind of work, and it's, I think it's going to be increasingly important. Do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice, nice talk. Um, uh, could you comment on your experience uh, working with human-derived neuroendocrine tumor in cell culture or in our animal models? versus uh, transfected non neuron tumor cells transfected to overexpress a somatostatin receptor? Yeah, the, the main problem is that we do not have so many nice models available for the, for the preclinical studies. So we are a bit struggling there, and that was one of the reasons that we, uh, for prostate cancer, for instance, or breast cancer, we have so many, many, many models for different uh, um, types of disease and, and different stages of disease, but for neuroendocrine tumors, it's much more difficult. And also, if you have a good model, like there's a few that seem to be quite good, they are proliferating so slowly that the experiments become very, very expensive. So that's one of the reasons that we went into this uh, tissue culture of the human samples, which is also not that easy because the tumor is quite rare and we do not have that often the, the samples, so we really try to use them as good as possible. 
don't see <clears throat> don't see any other hands going up, so maybe I could just one finish more. with one question. Um, Excuse me. Your your work was very focused on um, the DNA and the yes. cell nucleus as a target. What, what's your view on whether we should be looking also at other potential targets for radiation damage that might initiate apoptosis? Another target, like the membrane, you the mean? The membranes yeah. or mitochondria? Yeah, whatever. this is definitely something that we should look into as well. We did not touch it, but there's now so much evidence that we should also go into that, that we aim for that uh, for future experiments. We have another question. Yeah, I just have one question. I mean, this antagonist question is so fascinating. And one of the questions that I'm, I'm wondering is, is the, is the lutetium also, or the, 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 radio, the radionuclide also staying on the outside of these cells throughout yes. the entire yeah. six days? Or have you looked at whether it's internalizing at all? Well, we don't know. We did not uh, really test if it's not internalized at all, because all cells are oh, sorry, constantly internalizing medium, etc. So finally, if you leave the radioactivity long enough or uh, if it stays on the, uh, on the receptor long enough, it will finally be internalized as well. But it's not internalized uh, a, a couple of, via the same mechanism as the uh, agonist. So it takes a, a much longer time. Uh, one more. Uh, excellent talk. I just was wondering, do you, th do you think the PARP inhibitors are going to be selective? In other words, are you worried about a risk of overall increasing radiosensitivity in other tissues. Uh, I mean, in other words, what, what, so you can increase radiosensitivity quite a few ways, but if it's not selective, it may not be uh, so beneficial. Yes, we, we just took one uh, from a company that we are, have a collaboration with already. Um, what we tried to do here is that we gave the lutetium octreotide and then we washed it away and then we came with the PARP inhibitor. So um, we do not aim for the same uh, administration at the same time, but I, can, I cannot see you. I only see a shadow because there's a lot of backlight. Sorry. It's for the best. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> um, so we think we should aim for injection of the uh, lutetium octreotide and then wait. And then uh, only after washout of the, of, the, of the blood, then we can start with the PARP uh, inhibitor. So when the lutetium octreotide is internalized already. And then probably everybody else knows the answer to this question, but I didn't get it. Uh, you, you, you said uh, there were more uh, sites for the antagonist than the agonist. Could you elaborate how that happens? Uh, we, we are not fully sure. We are planning to investigate that. The theory is that um, the agonist only binds to the receptor when it's coupled to the G protein because this is needed for the internalization process, whereas the antagonist probably can also target the receptors which are not coupled yet to the G protein. So there's a larger pool of that. So there's more binding sites. And for instance, we, we tested it on many uh, tissue samples now. For breast cancer, we saw up to 53 times higher binding of the antagonist over the agonist. Okay, thank you very much indeed.